Okay, so we are recording. Um, we want to again welcome everyone to this is our second um, session, our second episode, if you will, for Andrews University Chemistry Department uh, seminar program. Last week we had a change day where we went out in the community and try to improve the community that we live in. And so we are back this week um, for a very interesting seminar topic and presentation. Today, my co-host comes from Notre Dame. Um, his name is Johan Rook. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, yeah, and, and okay. <laughs> and uh we have an ongoing collaboration with his group. Um, he's a graduate student, but his professor is on here, I think, uh, Professor Morgan. She actually did a presentation for us now about two years ago, I believe. Um, and uh, Michelle is uh, one of our students here at Andrews who is um, part of that collaboration. So, um, Rohan, the time is yours to introduce our speaker. Um, all right. Well, our speaker today is Dr. Ivan Martinez, Ivan Martinez, who comes, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Cell Biology at Western Virginia University, as well as the Western Virginia University Cancer Institute. Originally from Mexico City, he finished his undergrad education with honors from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He went on to complete his PhD in molecular genetics and biochemistry at the University of Pittsburgh under Dr. Salim Khan's lab, uh, studying the interactions between HPV infections and microRNAs. Dr. Martinez continued his training as a postdoc fellow in the Department of Genetics at Yale University School of Medicine in Dr. Daniel Daimau's lab in collaboration with Dr. Joan Stites, lab studying the importance of microRNAs in uh, cellular growth um, arrest. After his training, he was recruited at the Western, Universe, uh, Western Virginia University in 2013. The goal of Dr. Martinez's research is to understand the importance of different types of non-coding RNAs in human cancers, as well as viral infections. Uh, Dr. Martinez has been invited to present his research at prestigious institutions such as Harvard, uh, the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School, the National Cancer Institute at the National Institute of Health, um, at the Gottens, Gottens University of uh, Max Planck Institutes in Germany and the National Institute of Geomic Medicine at Mexico, in Mexico. He is also involved in the organization of international meetings such as the workshop at long coding RNAs and artificial intelligence at the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, International Conference on Bioinformatics and Biomedicine for the last four years, as well as the 2022 Keystone Symposia named Small Regulatory RNAs from Bench to Bedside in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Finally, Dr. Martinez is a member of the World Health Organization COVID-19 Animal Model Group since 2021. And with that being said, guys, please welcome Dr. Yvonne Martinez. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Desmond and Johan. Uh, first, uh, for the invitation to have the ability to talk to you guys. Um, it's it's great to be with you guys here. And, and thanks again for the invitation. Uh, Johan, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, so I was um, talking to Desmond before that even though the title says Science and Ethics of HIA Cells, most of my, my presentation is going to be in the science part because as a scientist, I definitely feel more comfortable talking to you, talking to you guys about science and how HeLa cells literally changed the biomedical world. That's that's um, you know the the legacy that we have from Henrietta Lacks. And yes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Henrietta Lacks, and at the end I'm gonna probably open the forum for all of us to discuss the ethical part of this of these um, cells. But 
more than anything else, I want to introduce you into the the world of HeLa cells and their benefit that not only give to the world, but also give to my lab and in from basic science to apply science. So um, just to uh, show you uh, the first slide is, this is Henrietta Lacks. This is a photo with her husband, David, in 1945. And uh, this is a, a painting, this is a portrait by Katherine Nelson that she wants to capture the kindness of Henrietta Lacks uh, to the world and the cells that she gave to the world. Uh, there was, there was a, an exhibition in New York City uh, a, a couple of years ago. So who is Henrietta Lacks? So Henrietta Lacks uh, was uh, an African-American woman uh, whose cancer cells are the source of the HeLa cell line, the first immortalized human cell. So that's very important to, to notice. For many, many decades, uh, scientists were trying to grow human cells in vitro. And they were trying and ve they were very unsuccessful uh, for several reasons. But it was not until Henrietta's cells uh, were put in vitro in plastic to grow that was the first time that we achieved uh, that goal and opened a new a new door to to the biomedical field. Um, she was the source of these cells uh, by a tumor biopsy during the treatment of cervical cancer at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, in 1951. So actually the beginning of 1951, she, she went to John Hopkins that at that time was the only hospital in the area that treated black patients. And she went there because she felt, she said, a knot in her womb. She was feeling sick. Um, and she went just to see the doctors and see what they, they, they thought that she will have. So her doctor, Howard W. Jones, um, took a biopsy of a mass found in her, in her cervix and did some lab tests on them. And then soon after he actually uh, said that she has this malignant epidermoid carcinoma of the cervix. Uh, at that time, of course, we didn't have with the technology that we have right now, but in 1970 actually was, um, Recharacterize this tumor as an adenocarcinoma. So it was not a Peter carcinoma, it was actually adenocarcinoma. But a uh, few months after, August 8, 1951, uh, Lax, uh, who at that time was only 31 years old, uh, she went back to a routine treatment at Hopkins. Uh, they normally was treating her with radiation with these radium tube inserts they put inside of the cervix and asked uh, to be admitted to continue with uh, because she has this uh, severe abdominal pain. And, uh, and unfortunately, she actually passed on October 4, 1951. So you can see here that it was really fast. Uh, when she went to the doctor in the beginning in January and passing in October, uh, her disease was really, really uh, in a late stage. And unfortunately for her, she, you know, she couldn't survive this disease. But she actually gave us um, um, her cells, and, and that's why I'm going to be mostly talking about. So they found this cervical cancer. What is exactly cervical cancer? It's a type of cancer that you can see here that is normally in the cervical region before the uterus and, uh, and, and after the vaginal wall. So normally uh, clinicians, when they look at this, they see, they start to see this tissue, these changes in the tissue. As you can see here, when you see a normal cervix by a clinician, they see this very smooth region in the cervix, no problems. When they start to see some changes in the tissue, that's when they start actually start getting worried. And of course, they can develop in different stages until it's like um, late stage of cervical cancer. So unfortunately for, for Henrietta, when she showed up in, in at Hopkins, she already had a big, um, cancerous tissue in her cervix, and that's the one they actually were able to pull out some of the biopsies from them. But something interesting is, um, now we know at the time they didn't know this, as uh, that the Henrietta Lacks was infected with human papillomavirus. Um, and that's why that was one of the first evidence that these viruses actually are related to cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So something I don't know if you know this, but most of the most of the cancers that are in the world, fifteen percent of them are actually caused by 
um, infections. That doesn't mean that the cancer is um, infectious. That means that an agent like a virus or a bacteria could potentially be the first um, punch to develop cancer. So it's interesting to show you that a good percentage, around 15% of new cancers around the world are actually by infection agents, just like viruses, just like human papillomavirus or HPV. And actually in 1976, uh, Dr. Harold Surhausen was the first one to publish that human papillomavirus are actually important in their role to cause cervical cancer was uh, specifically a subtypes. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the subtypes of HPVs, but in this case, HPV type 16 and HPV type 18. Uh, now we know, for example, that Henrietta Lacks uh, was infected with uh, HPV 18. So HeLa cells are actually HPV 18 positive. They still have the virus. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you why. But interestingly enough, for, for this discovery, uh, Dr. Surhausen actually, he won the, the, the Nobel Prize in 2008. And I always uh, kind of joke with my students telling them, hey, if one day you really want to uh, win the Nobel Prize, you should be studying uh, viruses that cause cancer. Because if you look in the uh, history of tumor virology, that I'm not gonna go in detail here, but I'm just gonna show you in these red boxes, these are all the viruses that scientists since 19, early 19, uh, 1900s, all the way to 2008, all these viruses are being related to different type of cancers, uh, not only HPV, but other ones. And it turns out these discoveries of tumor virology, most of these um, researchers that study them, they actually won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, why? Because cancer is a, such a multifactorial disease that is hard to understand it uh, when a patient comes with a tumor. It's, it's hard to understand why this person, this patient was exposed to, you know? There's so many factors, so many genetic factors, environmental factors, that it's almost impossible to know exactly where was the first, like the first evidence of 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 carcinogenesis. But studying viruses actually, and these viruses that are related to the development of cancer are actually quite uh, easy to follow because you infect the cell and then you ask the question, what happened? What is the first things that happen inside the cell after the infection? And what of these things that happen inside the cell could potentially give you an idea of um, carcin the beginning of carcinogenesis. So most of these guys won the Nobel Prize precisely because of that. Most of the uh, cancer, bio cancer biology, even though most cancers, I, I show you most cancers are not related to viral infections, viral infections actually give them the first hint of how to discover specific oncogenes or uh, specific tumor suppressor genes. But let's go back to HPV. So HPV, we know it's important in uh, cervical cancer, uh, just like Henrietta Lacks and HeLa cells come from. And um, just to sh just show you uh, cervical cancers around the world, 99.7% of cervical cancers are HPV positive, mm. meaning that literally every single cervical cancer that you can find in the world will be because they have an infection of HPV. Um, but not only cervical cancer, most anogenital cancers are related to the infection of these virus, like anal cancer, vaginal cancer, vulva cancer, and even penile cancer are related to HPV infection. Interestingly enough, oral pharyngeal cancer now is between 60 to 70% of them are HPV positive. Uh, 30 years ago, if you ask me the question, how many oropharyngeal cancers are related to HPV infection, I will tell you that maybe only like 20%. So in the last 20, 30 years, it's been a high increase of oropharyngeal cancer actually related to the infection of HPV. And every year uh, here in the United States, between 20,000 to uh, women to 11,000 men, they develop 
a cancer associated with the infection of HPV. And around the world, more than half a million cases are new uh, of HPV infection, showing you that it's one of the most important, if not the most important infectious cause of cancer in the world. So again, there's the importance of HPV. But because of HeLa cells, that was the first ones that we were able to manipulate in the, in the lab, give us so many, so many clues, so many ideas of how to study HPV and how to study cancer. Now here on papillary marrow transmission, you can see here is mostly by sexual transmission, um, increase it depending on how many partners you have, and um, and it can be co-infected. This could be co-infection of, of, of new nates, uh, and, um, new babies, but they, they are rare. They could they could develop respiratory papillomatosis. But in general, uh, the most uh, prevalent way to get infected with human papilloma virus is by sexual contact. Fortunately for us, uh, for mostly the new generations, we have a vaccine against HPV uh, that can target, um, the, the latest one is Gardasil uh, 9 that is was developed in 2014. And that one, uh, we, um, is the one that the clinicians are using right now. That one can actually cover against low risk HPVs and high risk HPVs. So what does that mean, low risk and high risk? Like here, you show you that um, there are around 200 genotypes of HPVs that infect humans, and they're divided in low risk and high risk. Um, low risk meaning that these viruses will never develop, or they are nothing related to cancer. They can only develop warts. They can be genital warts, or they could be warts that we develop in our hands or our feet. Uh, but the high risk are the ones that are related to cancer, HPV 16, 18, and none other ones. But um, 18 is the one that uh, HeLa cells and Herita lax actually was infected with. But why these viruses are oncogenic? Like, why, what, what is the purpose? Why the virus cause cancer or is in, in, in involved in, the, in causing cancer? Because the viruses in general, they don't want their host, the person is infecting, to develop a disease. The only reason a virus wants, the only reason a virus infect a cell is to make more viruses. That's the only reason. So it turns out, uh, if you look at the genome of HPV, it's a very simple genome. They only have a very few genes, but there are two very important genes in this, uh, in this genome that is called E6 and E7. If you can see here, the genome of the virus is circular. Yeah, it's a circle that in the moment they go inside of the cell, they stay as a circle. And interestingly enough, the virus express a protein called E2 that comes from this gene. And this protein comes and repress the expression of these two genes, E6 and E7. So the virus wants to stay in a kind of like a dormant state after infection. Doesn't want that the cells know that they're infected. So the immune system doesn't detect the cells. So they want to stay kind of quiet. But now we know by several groups that just the infection of the virus can cause genomic instability, meaning chromosomes start getting fragile. And this event, the thing that happened is the virus actually breaks around this region where E2 protein is coming from. And now the genome of the virus integrate into the human genome mm -hmm. by accident. And now we have the viral genome inserted into the human genome. And because it's linearized in the region where this E2 protein come from, now the E2 protein doesn't exist. And now E6 and E7 genes of the virus can be expressed. And turns out E6 target a very important protein in our cells called P53. P53 and RB, also known as retinoblastoma, are the two main tumor suppressor genes in our cells, meaning these proteins are always checking our cells. Their, their only job is to check that our cells are fine, that there are no mutations, that everything is going okay. So what happened? In the moment that the virus goes in and integrates and express these oncogenic proteins, C6 and E7, they bind to P53 and bind to RB and they destroy them. And the destruction of P53 and RB cause immortalization of the cell. Mm -hmm. 
So interestingly enough, these viruses need when you when people are having um, intercourse or or having sex, the virus actually has to go through a cut or a brace to infect the basal cells of our skin, our epithelium, and then start going through the process of differentiation with the cell and make more viruses. So this is the normal life cycle of the virus. The virus wants to make more viruses. But if the virus integrates into the genome and get rid of these two proteins, now the cells are immortalized. And now the cells, they have to accumulate more mutations to become a cervical cancer. So I always tell my students, um, you have to differentiate between an immortalized cell and a cancer cell. So HeLa cells are immortalized, meaning our normal cells, if you take out, if you're able to take out part of your cells and put them and grow them in vitro, your cells will not divide more than 60 times. That's the average number of division our normal cells have. But if you put HPV inside the cells and get rid of, like I told you, the P53 and RB protein, now your cells are immortal. Meaning as long as you give them food, they will divide forever. And that's exactly what happened with Heredalax cells. Because, because they were infected with HPV 18, her cells became immortal. Mm -hmm. And now, even though she died in 1951, thousands of labs around the world have her cells and we can grow them as many times as we want to because they're immortal because of that virus. The infection of the virus caused the immortalization. And now, of course, we know that we can do that with any cell that we can think of. We can grab neuron cells, we can grab bone cells, we can grab any type of human cell. And if we artificially add HPV inside of them, we can immortalize. Hmm. And that's a huge advantage in research field because now we can manipulate them, we can grow them as much as we want to, and, and we can ask questions. But, like I said, E6 and E7, oncoproteins from the virus, not only target these two very important uh, tumor suppressor genes, P53 and RB. Now we know in the last several decades that target many, many other proteins in our genome. And all these proteins are involved in different steps of carcinogenesis. So it's not as simple as I just told you the story, but uh, but clearly P53 and RB are the most important targets for the virus. But why? Why the virus wants to immortalize cells? What is the purpose of the virus to immortalize cells? Well, it turns out there are different hypotheses. One hypothesis is, again, like I told you before, the virus wants to make more viruses. That's the only reason the virus infects a cell. But if a cell, for example, in this case, is in a G0 state, meaning is dormant, is not dividing, and is infected by the virus, the virus needs to wake her up because viruses need to steal the machinery of the cell to make more copies of themselves. And if the cell is in a kind of like a dormant state, they are not going to have enough machinery to steal with. So the thing that a virus does is get rid of that dormant state, make the cell replicate, and now they can steal more of that machinery. And that's how they can make more viruses. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for us, is uh, this could potentially develop, uh, you know, could be a consequence of cancer. Or the other hypothesis is that the cell is just dividing happily and then suddenly get infected by the virus. And then the cell says, oh my gosh, I'm infected by a virus. I'm going to stop. I'm going to tell my immune system, please get rid of it. But then the virus says, no, wait a second. I'm going gonna, gonna to get rid of your tumor suppressor genes. I'm going to uh, avoid the immune system, and now you're going to make more viruses, uh, or you're going to, or I'm going to stay with you every time you divide. 
So there are definitely there are definitely different hypotheses that why these viruses are related to oncogenesis in humans. But going back to HeLa cells, um, HeLa cells, like I said, nineteen fifty one. It was a huge accomplishment by scientists to be able to grow a human cell in vitro. Before HeLa cells, the only cells that were actually be able to grow in vitro was chicken cells, actually, mm. but no human cells. And because of this, because of this discovery and how to uh, see the conditions of growing and the media that you need for growing was the beginning of the establishment of, of cell lines, of human cell lines. And here I'm just going to give you a brief list of cell lines that came after HeLa from different uh, organs, all human uh, cell lines. Um, but um, because of HeLa cells, we were scientists were able to manipulate the media, manipulate the conditions, and now we were actually able to grow other type of cell lines from different organs, from different uh, different type of tumors in in human cell in human cells. Um, and again, this is just a very short list mm -hmm. since 1990. Right now, if you ask me how many human cell lines we have, I will say more than a thousand mm -hmm. um, cell lines um, that uh, every lab you know, around the world are developing. Uh, for studying several diseases. But HeLa cells technically was the first line of immortalized human cells. And I'm just going to tell you a little, you know, interesting data about HeLa cells. If you look at a normal cell karyotype, yeah, this is the way it should look. If you remember your um, genetic classes, we have um, 23 pairs of chromosomes, humans, and you can see here, and that's the way a normal cell should look like, yeah? Every pair chromosome number one, the pair of chromosome number two, and so on, and then the X chromosomes. Now look at the HeLa cell karyotype. This is the karyotype of HeLa cells. They have an amazing amount of mutations and amplifications and duplications of chromosomes. Wow. So just tell you the genetic differences between HeLa cells and a normal cells. It's out. It's outstanding. Yeah. And I think because of that, there that's where we're able to grow them in vitro so easily in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Not only that, there have been studies showing that HeLa cells evolve even outside of Henrietta Lacks, meaning this study collect 13 different HeLa cells from different labs around the world, and then they did genetics on them. And they realized now the HeLa cells that I have are different from the HeLa cells that somebody has in Australia and the mm -hmm. HeLa cells that somebody else have in Europe. Because every time you grow them and you pass them in vitro, they're going to start accumulating mutation. They're going to start evolving. They're going to try to adapt to their new environment. So it's just fascinating to show that even a cell line that has been with us for so many years, there actually has the capability still to adapt and evolve and continue growing in different conditions. And not only that, you know, this is another interesting uh, thing. Uh, Kilo cell was the first cell line that went to space. Uh, the mm -hmm. Russians actually took him, uh, Pavel Popovich. He took Kilo cells just first to check if radiation in in human cells, how detrimental radiation was in human cells. But interestingly enough, when they went in space and look at how fast the Kilo cells were dividing, turns out they were dividing faster in space mm -hmm. than in on Earth, telling you that microgravity conditions also could affect the division of cells. So these are just a few, but I'm gonna just give you a very brief list of achievements that science had um, because of Elon. So 
for example, 1952, that was established, established HeLa cells, yeah? And over the next 60 years, thousands of scientists with over 111, 110,000 researcher publications are publishing with HeLa cells. I've been fortunate to have several publications uh, with HeLa cells too. Then in 1953, actually HeLa cells laying the groundwork for polio vaccine. So scientists discovered that HeLa cells are found to be an effective tool to grow large amounts of polio viruses and, 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 and try to develop this polio vaccine. 56, understanding the effects of x-rays in human cells. So that's why I was telling you uh, these um, people were radiating the cells and understanding how it could damage cells and how it could damage DNA. 1956, developing cancer research methods. A lot of Bio, uh, biomedical methods that we have in our labs are actually were standardized using HeLa cells. Again, going down to space in 1964. In 1964 too, um, uh, shedding light of treatment of blood disorders. So HeLa cells are used to study the potential treatment between the drug called hydroxyurea against certain blood cancers and sickle cell anemia. Again, they were very important to understand sickle cell anemia and, and, and how we can... Uh, uh, understand the disease. 73, um, determine how salmonella causes infections. So scientists use HeLa cells to look at, um, to, they discover actually that HeLa cells get infected with salmonella faster than other cells. And that actually helped them to be a more cost efficient ways to understand and develop um, uh, drugs against that. 1985, um, again, this is what I was telling you, Dr. Suhausen won the Nobel Prize by understanding that HPV is a main, um, one of the main causes to developing a certain uh, cancers. Then uh, 85, uh, slowing cancer growth. Again, uh, people were using this uh, campothecin uh, to reduce, uh, to as a, as a drug against cancers. And the first cell line they used was HeLa cell, even though these type of drugs work now with ovarian, lung, and cervical cancers too. Um, I'm sorry. Um, 88, HIV infections. In the beginning of HIV pandemic, uh, scientists discovered that HeLa cells are not easy to infect with HIV. And because of that, we're actually we're able to understand more in the mechanisms of how HIV needs certain conditions and certain receptors to get inside the cells. And HeLa helps to understand which receptors were important for that. Um, how cells age, and that's one of the, the, the uh, few things I'm gonna tell you in a little bit. That's one, one, one of my research, how, how aging could be related with HeLa cells. HeLa cells show us how cells can actually age or not. Um, cell imaging, uh, Ebola and HIV, uh, Nobel Prizes, and I think the most important one is in 2013, that um, HeLa cells allow research to continue to advance science while protecting privacy. So the National Institute of Health reached an agreement with the descendant of Heritalax to allow biomedical research control access to the whole genome data of HeLa cells. Access to the whole genome data of the cells will be a valuable ref reference tool for researchers to study the cause and effect of many diseases with goal of developing treatments. This landmark agreement ex exemplifies NIH continued commitment to see research participants on partner research enterprise. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the NIH National Institute of Health got with an agreement with Henrietta Lacks family to be able to get the whole, the consent of the whole genome. Because like I showed you before, the HeLa cells are already evolving, they are already Genetically speaking, they are not going to look the same that they read lacks. So to study really the original genome of Henrietta lacks, for that, you need the permission of the family and you need the permission to have access. And then you can actually compare them and help you to understand how from non-cancer cells in her cervix became HeLa cells. In my lab, one of the things we're studying is senescence, meaning aging. I don't know if you guys know this, but like I was telling you before, our cells has a certain amount of divisions. After 60 divisions, they become senescent, they age, they become old. 
And now we know, of course, that the older we get, the more senescent cells we're going to have in our bodies. So one of the things that we study in my lab is how to induce artificially senescence in cells. Mm -hmm. And it turns out one of the best models for senescence are actually HeLa cells. Because HeLa cells, like I told you before, they have HPV18 inside of them. So the P53 and RB tumor suppressor genes are not present. But if we artificially add E2 to the HeLa cells, we can actually push the cells to become senescent mm -hmm. in four days. Something that in the laboratory takes months. Doing this, we can have all the cells completely senesced in four days. So that was a huge traumatic difference that we're actually able to use for research. Um, we have several controls where we infected with the E2 protein, but we still were able to artificially uh, repress the tumor suppressor genes so the cells still proliferating and other controls just to be sure that we are actually able to induce senescence in a different way. So having this, we were looking at the expression of microRNAs. Because for in my lab, we were trying to understand if microRNAs were involved in senescence. Uh, what are microRNAs? I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of what uh, microRNAs are. If you remember your central dogma of molecular biology, every single time I talk about this um, in in my lectures, I I uh, I love to 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 show you why I'm so passionate about non coding RNAs, hmm. because it turns out if you follow the central dogma of molecular biology, we know that the DNA is where we have all the information, all the genetic information to form an organism. Yeah, and we know that this DNA has to be transcribed to RNA, and at the end, the final products are proteins. This is a dogma. This is the thing we're following for the last 60 years in the biomedical research. Turns out in the early 2000s, when people were able to sequence the human genome and the genome of several or other organisms, we not only sequence the DNA, but we sequence the RNA. And something was not matching. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this is imagine that this blue circle is the, the DNA of a bacteria. Yeah. How much of this DNA? is transcribed to RNA, we know that 98% of the DNA is transcribed to RNA in bacteria. Yeah? How much of this RNA is translated to proteins? 95%. Yeah? But if you ask the same question for an insect, for example, how much of the DNA of an insect is transcribed to RNA? Same, around 90%. Sorry, 95% of the, the DNA is transcribed to RNA. But when you say how much of this RNA is translated to proteins, it goes down to 70%, yeah? But what happened with humans? When you ask the same question in humans, how much of our DNA is transcribed to RNA, we're still talking about close to 90% of our genome is transcribed to RNA. How much of this RNA is translated to protein? 2%. Why? Why we have this universe of RNAs in our cells that doesn't translate to protein. And now we, in the beginning, people thought it was just chunk that we have in our genome. But now we consider that as the dark matter of biology. <laughs> okay. Because it's there, but we have absolutely no idea what is our function. Oh my goodness. So now we know that all these RNAs are called non-coding RNAs. And that's exactly what my lab is doing, is trying to understand the function of non-coding RNAs. And one of these non-coding RNAs is called microRNAs. These microRNAs, I'm not going to give you all the details of them. They have a specific type of biogenesis. Uh, but we have around 2,654 human microRNAs in our genome. They can regulate 70% of our genes, and they're very important in diseases. So I use HeLa cells, actually, to discover that certain microRNAs are important in senescence. We were the first group to show that microRNAs were actually, specifically these families, 
mere 29 and mere 30 were involved in human cell senescence. And we use HeLa cells for that. We also demonstrate that these are regulated by other transcription factors. And um, I'm not gonna give in too much detail to this, but just to demonstrate that yes, these microRNAs were regulated by the pathway that is the retinoblastoma pathway that is the one affected by HPV in HeLa cells. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the virus is actually affecting the population of microRNAs and affecting aging and senescence. But finally, I guess we need to talk about the ethics of this, you know? I told you all the science part of HeLa cells, but at the end of the day, these HeLa, these HeLa cells came from Henrietta Lacks. And it was shocking for me the first time I heard that the family of Henrietta Lacks didn't even know hmm. that people for decades were growing her cells and uh, studying thousands and thousands of different uh, experiments and benefiting, uh, you know, taking the benefit of them to, to, for the world. Uh, and the family, of course, they, like I said here, how is then that Mr. Lack's family didn't even know of this great gift she gave to the world? They didn't know until very recently. And I think that's why, uh, you know, in the last 10, 10 years um, came the suing of the family uh, to uh, Thermo Fisher. It was the first company that was sued. Now we have to all, always put, I think, this in, in the context of history. When John Hopkins obtained the cells from Herita Lacks, at that time, there was no really protocols to obtain tumors or obtain samples from patients and, and follow a very strict regulation that we have right now. At that time didn't exist. And Hopkins uh, University still says that they didn't um, benefit economically speaking from these sales. But these, these companies did. Thermo Fisher, and the, I think there's still another sue against other company because they actually benefit uh, economically speaking from these sales. And if you ask me, I will say that 80%, if not more, of biomedical laboratories in the world have HeLa cells. Yep. So we all benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is definitely an important uh, achievement by the family to number one, get the credit that Henrietta Lacks deserved. Number two, to uh, not only get the economic benefit from these companies, but also demonstrate that even though it was many, many years ago, uh, we still have the responsibility as a scientist and as a society to give credit who deserves it. Economics is speaking and also the, the credit they deserve to, like I just showed you, uh, her, her cells uh, open the biomedical field um, to the rest of the world. So um, I'm very happy, very glad that this um, Settlements are happening. Uh, I said, like I said, I, I'm pretty sure right now there's another one running against another company, but at least the Thermo Fisher one was 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 uh, done uh, a few few months ago. Yeah. And uh, and we, as a scientist and as a research community, we have to really think about this carefully. You know, like things that we think that are ethical right now, how are they going to see it in 30, 50? hundred years from now, are we really giving credit to the patient that is donating their samples to science? Are we um, not only giving credit, economically speaking, but um, you know, when, every time we publish a paper saying thank you very much for, uh, you know, sometimes you don't want to give, of course, the patient names, um, that's a HIPAA uh, regulation, 
but at least give credit to the person that actually donate their cells. And I think it's a it's it's a tricky question sometimes because you want to you want to give the credit who deserves it, but at the same time you don't want people to feel that scientists are gonna take advantage of it. So it's it's a balance that we need to achieve where both sides are satisfied and uh we are not um end up like uh you know Henrietta Lacks family. Uh, fighting for decades uh, mm -hmm. to get the credit that, that she deserved. Nice. So uh, that's it. Okay. Any... Yes. Thank you very much. Let's. Thank you. So, um... so um, John, you want to start us off? Comments, question, what? Uh... Oh. Honestly, Professor, you, uh, very informative. I had one question actually. Um, sure. I wanted to know, um, if you knew like when that p fifty three protein isn't disrupted by the HPV, what is its mechanism for suppressing tumors? Like when it's normally functioning. That yeah, very sense. good question. Very very good question. So p fifty three is is called like the sentinel of our genome. He's going around the genome checking that there's no mutations. Checking that there is no um, uh, DNA damage. Normally, in normal situations, uh, your DNA can break. Mm -hmm. And in the moment they break, they send a signal. And the signal is actually caught by the, by P53. And P53 can say, can, P53 has the ability to sense the cell and say, okay, we can maybe fix the problem. But if we cannot fix the problem, I'm going to send the cell to apoptosis, meaning I'm going to kill the cell. Uh, I see. Okay. So that has that efficiency. And not only that, is is 53 is a very unique uh, uh, protein that is involved in many, many, many regulations. Yeah. No. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay. Other questions, either on chat or you could verbalize it, speak loud. Novak, you have questions, oh, don't you? Question. Yes. <laughs> so you made the statement that HPV was an early healer cell. You know, those cells have been passaged, I mean, a bazillion times, not to exaggerate, and I may not be exaggerating. And, and you know, what do the earliest unmolested samples, the ones that have been passaged the least, do they have HPV in them? I mean, what, where, you know, I'm, I just, I, I question the surety with, with which people say he was there. Because it's been so universal and so aggressive, um, and so what's the earliest passages uh, that they still have? Then do they contain HPV virus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, Hopkins has the earliest of passages because that's where the sample was collected, okay. and um, yes, every single passage of HeLa cells, no matter where you get it, has HPV eighteen on them. Okay. Actually. The, the virus is already integrated in the genome 60 times. Hmm. But there are 60 copies of HeLa, of HPV-18 in HeLa cells. doesn't matter where you go in the world, you have between 60 to 80 copies. And the early stages, uh, early passages of HeLa cells, they still have HPV. We know that in cervical cancer, infection of HPV is a very early um, it's a very early event. Actually, I didn't tell you this, but like if you grab a hundred person right now and you screen for HPV, I can guarantee that 20% of them will be HPV positive in this moment. HPV is a very, um, is the most infectious, um, more prevalent, um, um, infectious, uh, disease by, um, uh, sexual transmitted disease. But fortunately for us, even though you can be infected with HPV, most of the time your body is able to recognize the cells that are infected and destroy them and eradicate the infection. Hmm. Only, only 5% of women infected with HPV end up developing cervical cancer. Questions? 
this was a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, yeah, Actually, I I wonder. If, I can, if I can jump in here again, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, on your slide, you're looking at the the, uh, the uh, prevalence of HPV and the variety of cancers that you had. The the biggest increase that we've been able to tell, of course, is that oral pharyngeal cancer that it moved from very low percentages up to sixty percent. Mm -hmm. Um, talk to me about the public health implications of that. Uh, I, you probably are not a public health educator, but what would you say to a young person who's seeing that and asking, well, how's that happening? Yeah. So we we still trying to understand why. There are several hypotheses. Number one is um, 30 years ago, there were more head and neck cancers related to tobacco and alcohol intake, meaning people were smoking more and they were drinking more than now, the new generations. So that's one That's one. Uh, one of the little pieces of the puzzle, I think, that makes the difference of increasing, changing the, the percentages. The other one is uh, early sexual activity and oral sex. There's evidence that oral sex and the number of sexual uh, um, partners that you have, the higher you have, the more more um, uh, potential uh, um, infection you're going to have uh, in the oral cavity. So there are changes at the cultural level, there are changes at the social level. But if you ask me exactly what is the reason, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a straight answer. Sure. They don't know. Okay. okay, I I have a question too. Um, is is HPV the only virus that could immortalize cells? No. Okay. No, it's not. Um, the, there are other oncogenic viruses like SV forty that can immortalize cells. Um, there are uh, Epstein Barr virus that can immortalize cells. So. There are several. There are several uh, human okay. viral infections that could potentially immortalize cells, but none of them are as good as HPV. Okay. HPV is very good in doing that, and that's why some people use them as a tool. Like they, when they're studying, let's say, a very specific type of neuron, let's say, that is very hard to grow in vitro, but they want to study that neuron. Sometimes scientists they infect it with HPV. And now the neuron is immortalized, and now they can grow them in vitro for many, many, you know, years. Has there been any connection between like COVID virus and cancer? Is there any connection there? COVID and cancer. Uh -huh. There are some start to be some evidence that the COVID is SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, it's a completely different type of virus. It's an RNA virus uh, that infects several different types of cells. But there start to be some publications showing that inflammation of the lungs by COVID could potentially be one of the first um, punches to develop certain type of, of lung cancers. Um, but unfortunately, again, um, we need to wait sometimes many years or even decades to yeah. see right. if um, the infection of that virus could cause certain uh, mm -hmm. cancer diseases, yeah. Okay. Any students have questions? Um, you said that like uh, HPV has specific causes in general. Based on the like, sample time, where do we usually stuff? Like, which basic, which type of DNA usually insert itself? Did you did you hear the question? I couldn't hear it. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. That's okay. Um, I think the question is, where does the HPV virus insert into the human genome? Right. If it, okay. If it does it sixty times, is there a pattern of where it inserts? Yeah. Yeah. That was actually a very good question too. In the beginning, we thought that was just completely <laughs> random uh, because in the beginning you saw that the, 
some some HPV cell lines, they only have like two copies of HPV. Other ones, they can have all the way to 500 copies. Um, HeLa cells, like I said, is have something between 60 to 80 copies. Um, the, the In the beginning of research of HPV, people thought it was just completely random. It looks random. But in the recent years, people start to realize that there are certain chromosomal fragile sites hmm. that HPV, for whatever reason, likes to integrate more than other places. And interestingly enough, some of these fragile sites are close to certain human oncogenes. So there's already publication showing that the integration of the virus also could disrupt human oncogenes and even help more in the developing of cervical cancers. So our biochemists got all excited about the proximity to oncogenes. Could you like elaborate on this some more <laughs> so the rest of us could understand why he's all, you know? <laughs> yeah, there is a very, uh, very good publication in the 19, I think it was 19, late 1990s, um, that they demonstrate that <clears throat> the integration of HPV uh, likes to integrate close to an uh, oncogene called CIMIC. And mm. CIMIC is very important in certain cancers. And um, and they demonstrate that the integration kind of modify and activate the promoter of CIMIC. And now there's more expression of the oncogene. Mm. Okay. Oncogene is, it, it, oncogene is a gene that is expressed tends toward disrupting cell metabolism and cell regulation and leads to cancer. Uh, because the oncogene often is kind of what is Latin for okay. kind of, it's connected to uh, cancer. Oh, okay. So, okay, viruses could trigger cancer. Right. Does bacteria, is there information, evidence that bacteria could also trigger yes. cancer? Oh, yes. Okay. There is that evidence. H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, oh. is, the, is the only example we have of a bacteria that is involved in stomach cancer. Oh. Yeah. Actually, the guy that discovered that, the guy that discovered H. pylori uh, has to do something crazy because nobody believes him that bacteria could live in our stomach when we have uh, pH you know, of mm -hmm. two, it's like mm -hmm. it's impossible that a bacteria live. Well, he actually infect himself with H. pylori and demonstrate yes. that they can develop ulcers in the in the stomach, and that ulcers and that inflammation is involved in the developing of um, stomach cancer. What? Yep. Yeah. So the guy, so the guy was completely rejected by all the consensus of science. Right. And so he, he truly believed this. So he did not have ulcers. He took a sample or two of this H. pylori and medically got ulcers. He then cured himself with an antibiotic and published it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, wow. be careful about consensus in science. I mean, consensus is important. The consensus, honestly, doesn't is always. Not science. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It's true. But there is, as far as I, again, I'm not, I'm not a follower in H. pylori, and 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 I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not involved in, in gastric cancer. But the few papers that I heard, and there's actually a person working here at WVU, working with H. pylori and inflammation of the stomach, um, they can actually show that yes, the, the bacteria develop inflammation, the inflammation change the immune system, and there are some models of or of gastric cancer using H. pylori. Now, how they mimic the real world, again, mm -hmm. these are animal models, these are in vitro models. I know there are specific plasma that H. pylori has that makes so much pylori um, uh, 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 strains more prone to, the, to cause inflammation than other ones. So yes, we have to be careful, I agree. With, with where the, the information, the literature come from. But I think there's at least good good evidence, um, several groups showing that there's at least a link between the, the bacterial infection and, and, and stomach cancer. 
All right, we are at around 5.30 now. Um, yes. We want to thank you very much. Um, in, in, fact, in, in fact, in class today, we were talking about when scientific presentations are done. Uh, sometimes we are overwhelmed with um, jargons and abbreviations. And I think you are a good example of how to avoid those, but good communicator. Yes, very good. I think all of my students would appreciate that. Thank, Thank you very much. Thumbs up, dude. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you Joanne. Guys. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> It's okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Very good. Very good. Even thank for non-biochemists, I was able to follow stuff. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care. See you. Okay.